Hello everyone. My name is Rudvan Aydınlı. I'm an ethnomusicology graduate student at Wesleyan University. Today I will explain and demonstrate the seyir concept of Ottoman Turkish makam music. Seyir as a musical term has been translated into English as melodic direction or progression. However, today I will use another analogy that is a recipe. Let's begin cooking. Before starting the recipe, let me introduce some basics of the Turkish music theory that is currently in use today. The system is known as 24 non-tempered system that has 24 pitches within an octave that is divided into 53 microintervals in theory. Each of these microintervals is called comma. A whole tone is divided into 9 and a half tone is divided into 4 commas. Each pitch has a name as can be seen in the picture. Those names may have three meanings contextually. They may represent a makam, a tetrachord or pentachord, and a pitch. All three are related to a particular makam. The scale of a makam consists of tetrachords and pentachords, or even trichords and hexachords in some cases. In other words, if those X chords are ingredients of our musical meal, the scale of the makam would be the basket of ingredients. I should mention that the X chords of a particular makam would be called as çeşni in Turkish music. Çeşni does not require an analogy because it is already a gastronomical term that literally means flavor, savor and so on. As we all know, Having the ingredients does not suffice to cook the meal. We need a recipe. And the recipe in this context would be the seyir. The literal meaning of seyir is a journey, progress, looking on or watching and so on. Seyir is used in two manners in Turkish music theory, rough and detailed. While the correspondence of the rough seyir would be the melodic direction, the detailed version would be the melodic progression. The rough sayer has three types, ascending, descending, and ascending, descending. In ascending type, the melody would start around the tonic, which is the karar, then in descending type, the melody would start around the upper tonic, which is tizdurak, then descends. In ascending-descending type, the melody would start around the dominant, which is güçlü in Turkish, makes a journey by ascending and descending. I must mention that all three types of melodic directions should descend at the end. In other words, the conclusion would be on the tonic, which is karar. Back to the recipe. The rough seir would entail the basic ingredients and their orders to be put into the pan. Let's see the brief recipe of the chef who is reluctant to explain the process. This is the basic scale of the makam rust. Chef would explain the makam rust's direction as ascending, which means starting the melody around the tonic, karar, by using the rust pentachord and tetrachord flavors. After accomplishing the first part, rust or buselic tetrachord would be used to be concluded via rust pentachord on the karar, that is the rust pitch. Although reluctant chef's description gives us the basics, we are still far from understanding how rust is cooked. There comes the generous chef with the detailed recipe, comprehensive version of the seir, which could be coined as melodic progression. Let's see the second type of seir on makam rust. The generous chef would start the recipe by explaining the lower extension of the makam, that is another tetrachord below the karar. Starting the melody around the karar, therefore, would also entail using the lower tetrachord as well as the pentachord. The aim of the first move is to reach the dominant, güçlü, neva pitch in this case, either directly or indirectly. Indirect journey may include adding other sub-flavors that are the chef's tricks. Those flavors are the ones that we could sense but could not identify. There is something else in this recipe. 
While trying to reach the dominant, Neva, the chef advises using Sega and Duga flavors by making suspended cadences on the relative pitches. As soon as we reach the dominant, we should take a rest and let it boil for some time before going for the upper tonic. While rendering the melody around the dominant, similar to the lower pentachord, different flavors and suspended cadences may be of use on the way to the upper tonic, Gerdania. Taking the upper tonic as the gravity center of the melody, descending part would start with the necessary steps of visiting the dominant and concluding on the karar. While descending from the upper tonic, the chef would give the trick for using the ajem flavor, altering F sharp to F natural as part of the melodic attraction. Similar suspended cadences and so flavors would be added on the way down. Before concluding the composition or improvisation in Makam Rast, visiting the Rast tetrachord below the Karar or at least hitting the leading tone, Urak pitch in this case, which is F sharp, would give the final touch before leaving the fire open for some time on the Rast pitch. The duration and emphasis of each flavor depend on the length of the composition or improvisation and the taste of the composer or the performer. The recipe would suffice to render the makam rust sufficiently but not perfectly or tastefully. Working in the same kitchen with the master chef by being the apprentice who practices a lot would be the only way of accomplishing that goal. As soon as the apprentice becomes capable of cooking this recipe Coming up with a new recipe, setting the amount of each flavor, being able to decide to serve it salty, spicy, hot or mild would be inevitable. After drawing the overall picture, let me sing something for you to give example for ascending, descending and descending makams. In order to show the significance of Seir, I chose two same scale makams, Husseini and Muhayyar. First piece is a Sufi hymn in Makam Husseini. Composer is unknown, but the lyricist is famous Mevlevi poet Sheikh Galib. The second piece is a Sharkı song composed by Sherki Bey, one of the prominent composers of Sharkı form in the 19th century. Before each piece, I introduce the Usul rhythmic cycle of the piece for several measures. terk eyle takdir hudanındır tedbirini terk eyle takdir hudanındır sen yoksun o bellikle hep vehmi gümanındır sen yoksun o
Ahlanimiz ol saçlar Leyla ile ahi Ahlanimiz ol saçlar Leyla ile ahi Mecnun gibi alemlere destan olacaktır Mecnun gibi alemlere destan olacaktır Before talking about the pieces I just sang, let me show the scales of Hüseyni and Muhayyer. As we can see, they share the same scale. However, their melodic directions, I mean rough sayers, are different. In the Sufi hymn, the melody starts around the dominant of Makam Husseini while leaping from the tonic, the fifth. Although it touches to the upper tonic, which is Muhayyar pitch, it paid a short visit and did not stay long. After touching the note C, Chargah pitch, which is one of the characteristic suspended cadences of the Makam Husseini, it concluded on the tonic, A, Dugah pitch. F naturals, thanks to the Ajem flavor, are visible throughout the melody. As I explained in the Makam Rast, melodic attraction led to alteration of F sharp to F natural because of the descending character of the melody. Although it stayed as F sharp when the melody ascends. When we look at the Muhayyar song, we can see that the melody starts around the upper tonic, the octave of the A, or the Muhayyar pitch. The nature of this descending makam necessitated it to render the melody around the upper tonic more heavily. Apart from the short rests on the dominant E, Husseini pitch, and suspended cadences on D, it immediately went to the karar. All in all, different rough sayers brought different emphasis areas, different comprehensive sayers, and so different makams. Different orders of cooking necessitated different progressions for the meal that resulted in a separate makam or a separate meal. In the following performance, I will play two instrumental pieces with my instrument, nay. Those of you who might find the scores and the performed tuning confusing, let me put this. No matter which register is chosen to be performed in, scores are written in the original Bola Henk tuning to be transposed by the performer on spot for Turkish music. Those tunings are defined over ney types and sizes as shown in the table. Ney players are relatively luckier than the others since they can change their instruments and play on the same position. That's why I have this collection behind me. The first piece is an excerpt from Esas Semai in Makam Sega from 17th century. I will play the first and the fourth last subsections, Hanez, and refrain sections, Teslim or Mülazime, of the piece. The second piece is in Makam Hijaz that is called Zer Mahbub, the Golden Beloved. This piece is generally performed at the Mevlevi rituals. In between those two pieces, I will play a Geçiş Taksimi, Transitional Taksim, Transitional Instrumental Improvisation. The idea of a Transitional Taksim is to start with a certain Makam and concluding with another Makam using the flavors and modulations. Segah is an ascending makam, so I will be able to pay my debt from the first part, whereas Hijaz is an ascending descending makam. For the transition taksim, I will use ascending part of Segah, and before starting to descend to conclude on makam, I will make several transitions to modulate to Hijaz, with which I will conclude my taksim. After the Zer Mahbub, I will play a song, Last Taksim, which will start even higher than the upper tonic of the Makam Hijaz, as it is common in Mevlevi rituals. The explanation for exceptional series of Last Taksims 
might be left for the further presentations. So for now, thank you for listening and have a good one.
Hello, I'm David Nelson, as many of you know and some of you don't. <laughs> I teach Murdungam at Wesleyan and I have for 20 years. Uh, and I've also been around Wesleyan for a really long time. And I've been asked to tell a story or two about the time when I was just around for, at the beginning of a lot of things that were happening here. I went to India for the first time in 1970 and left in early 71. And my teacher at that time, Mr. C.S. Shankarasivam, who lived from uh, 1905 to 1993, suggested that I come to Wesleyan until I could return to India. Because Ramnad Raghavan was teaching here, and Ramnad Raghavan was the brother of one of Shankarasivam's students, Ramnad Iswaran. So that was the first I heard of Wesleyan. I didn't know anything about it. And so I thought about that. And then I got a letter from my singing teacher in India, S. Ramanathan, who said that he and his daughter were coming to teach at Wesleyan. Well, they were going to come that winter, that January 1972. And I said, well, that's amazing because I have that quarter off to do my senior independent project. And they said, well, come over. You can stay with us. Mighty generous. So I did that. I met them at uh, Colgate University for a couple of weeks. And then we traveled together to Middletown, which I had never seen before. And we uh, stayed in Mr. Ramanathan's house. Well, something I didn't know was that Mr. Ramanathan had a side student who was kind of lurking in the shadows and didn't really want to be uh, seen around campus, and his name was John McLaughlin, who at the time was quite a famous guitarist who had a fantastic band called the Mahavishnu Orchestra. I was a fan. And one day Mr. Ramanathan and his daughter were out, and I, I had heard that Mahavishnu Orchestra was coming to play at Wesleyan in the McConaughey Dining Hall, which none of you have seen, probably. There's a big circular glass, glassed-in hall. And when they did concerts in there, uh, this is very classy. They put out the tables, they put out the dining tables and put folding chairs on top of them for people to sit. So one day I was sitting in the house by myself and there was a knock on the front door. So I went to the front door and opened it, and there, I mean, I recognized him immediately, was John McLaughlin. And John McLaughlin asked me if Mr. Ramanathan was there, or if his daughter was there, and I said, no, I'm afraid they're not. And he said, well, my group is playing here in a few days, and I wanted to bring some tickets for you all. So he gave us tickets for his concert, which was really nice of him, to, especially to include me, whom he didn't even know. And so he went away, and they came home, and we all talked about that, and we agreed that we'd go to the concert separately, but after the concert, we'd get together and talk about it. Well, okay, that sounded fine to me. So I went to the concert, and um, it being a concert, and it being um, 1972, I managed to get herbed up before we went. And I went to the concert and climbed up onto one of those tables and sat in the folding chair. And we waited for the music to start. Well, I saw a young woman walking through the aisles with a big wine jug. And I thought, oh, now that would be tasty, wouldn't it? nice little sip of wine to help my dry mouth. So I asked her if I could have a sip of her wine. And she said, sure, and handed me up the jug and I took a big swig and it was water. And I handed it back to her and I thanked her very much and I said, you know, that's probably better for me. Yeah, that's okay, that's good. And so sat back, the music started and about 15 minutes into the concert, the bass player, was in my chest and winding his way through my whole body. And I realized that there had been something in that water. 
Now, it, I didn't know this at the time, but at that time, the Wesleyan chemistry labs were famous for the quality of LSD that they were producing. Um, in fact, the rumor was that the Grateful Dead came and played on Foss Hill mainly because they could get such great acid. So uh, all I can tell you is from my hmm, limited experience, uh, it was very clean acid. It was a very nice experience, but the concert ended after about two hours and I knew very well that I had about six hours to go. And the thought of going back to Ramanathan's house and trying to make any sense at all with the two of them just didn't compute. So I basically wandered the streets of Middletown. It was a cold night. It was a winter night. It was a cold night. And I wandered the streets of Middletown for as long as I could stand it and then figured that they'd probably be well asleep. So I crept back to the house. It was at 56 Fountain Avenue. Crept up the stairs, opened the door so quietly to the, to the main house, then opened the door to the apartment so quietly. And as I got it open, I realized that all the lights were on. And they were sitting in their living room on the sofa, waiting for me to come home. <coughs> now, I can't tell you anything about that conversation except that I was extremely glad when it was over. And I have no idea what any of us said, but nobody asked for me an nobody asked me for an apology the next day, so I guess it couldn't be too bad. So that's uh that was my introduction to Wesleyan. And I'm uh just happy that I got to share that with you and, and that was my uh, request from my students, B. Klein and um, Lisa, who asked me to tell that story. So now I've told it, and now we can get on to the, to the music. Thank you. The piece of music I'm about to show you was composed by Pani M. Subramanya Pillay, who lived from 1908 to 1962. He's widely regarded as one of the greatest Mridangam players in the history of the instrument, and with good reason. For one thing, he was a brilliant, brilliant performer, and there are several recordings that, that demonstrate this amply. He was also um, an innovator in terms of the kinds of compositions he introduced. And one of the great innovations that he introduced was a change in the approach to using different pulse rates within a piece. Now in South Indian music these are called nardais or uh, narda means way of walking, way of moving. The default is four but it could also be six, it could be seven, it could be five, it could be nine, and sometimes mixtures of those. So in this case uh, what he did was you take a composition that was based on fours. The phrases are all based on four. And he played that in six notes per beat. Now, previously, apparently, people had, this is anecdotal, but people had apparently counted it takita, 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 like that, without uh, using the phrasing that came with the other types of, of uh, material. So this, instead of taka dimi, taka dimi, taka dimi, it was takita, 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 takita. But Polony decided that it could be done in a different way. And so this piece came out of his work, and we don't know exactly when, probably in the 1940s. Um, by the time I was learning, it was part of the canon, something that my teacher taught to everybody and loved to play himself. It's uh, four lines of phrases based on four or eight, however you want to look at it. And it ends with a figure called mora. And a mora is a design. A mora is made up of uh, different 
a material that has different functions. For example, there are three statements, I call them, uh, and those are separated by something called gaps. And what happens then is there's tension created within the tala, and it has a, a cadential effect. And the mora is the fundamental cadential formula in South Indian music. So this piece, because it's based on fours, because all the phrases are based on fours, and the phrases themselves are a little intricate sounding. I'll show you. Tam, taka din, 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 na. Tarigatam, taka tu, taka din, tam, tam, di. So those are very interesting sounding phrases, and you don't necessarily hear it as based on four. But Polony knew that it was based on four and made it so that when it came to playing it in Tisra Nardai, which is six notes per beat, it sounded like this. And it changes the feel of it completely. So this piece now that I'm going to play, I'm going to recite it first and then I'm going to play it, has four lines of these quadratic phrases followed by a mora that kind of seals it off. So I'm going to play the whole thing in Chatursra Nardai, which is four pulses per beat. Then I'm going to play it in Tishra Nardai, six pulses per beat. And then in Fast Chatursra Nardai, which is eight pulses per beat, which is the way I was trained to do it. I'm going to speak it first, and then I will play it. Here we go. And I'm going to use this device, uh, this iPhone app called Talanome was designed by Sridhar Rajagopalan. Um, it's a brilliant thing. It's a very helpful device for us in, in this music, and you really need to hear the tala in order to understand how the material fits within it. So here we go. Sadi tala. Two counts per beat. Four, five, six, seven, eight, eight. Down. Taka din 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 na. Tarigata tum taka tum taka din tam tam di. Kita taka din 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 na. Tarigata tum taka tum taka din din na. Kita taka tam. Tam. The taka din 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 na. Tarigata tum taka tum taka din tam tam di. Kita taka din 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 na. Tarigata tum taka tum taka din din na. Kita taka tam. Here's the mora. Tam. Taka din na tum taka tum taka din na din na. Kita taka tam. Tam. Now, you may wonder how long it takes to learn a thing like that. Well, I can tell you that my Solkatu class learned it in, I think it was two full sessions in both of those speeds, in all three of those speeds. How did we do that? Well, because the phrases are fours and eights, it's possible to do it in a simplified way so that they learn how to feel, especially that tithram, the feel the, the six per beat, um, even with the eight note phrases. And the way I figured out to do that was by substituting the simplified phrase, taka dimi taka jonu, for the phrases in the composition. So I'll show you how that works. Two, three, four, so. Taka dimi, taka 
Takkan jondu, takkan dimmi, takkan jondu, takkan dimmi, takkan jondu, takkan dimmi, takkan jondu, takkan dimmi, takkan jondu, takkan dimmi. And now in this room, takkan dimmi, takkan jondu, 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 takkan dimmi, and what we do is substitute phrases from the composition in place of those eight note phrases so that they learn how to do little bits like this. And once they've learned all the phrases like that, we can put them together and do the whole composition. So, what I want to do now is play it for you. Five, six, seven, eight, and... The Polony composition, as I call it, that I played for you in the last clip, has become <coughs> very popular with many, many drummers, uh, largely because it's generative. In other words, it suggests development beyond its original form. <coughs> Karekuri Armani has done a lot of things with it. My teacher, T. Raghunathan, did some things with it. I've done some things with it. And a couple of years ago, when I was at the Cleveland Festival, listening to a concert by my colleague Balu, he was accompanied by Trichy Shankaran, who was also a student of Pani Subramanya Pillay, who did a version of it I didn't understand. And it bothered me that I didn't understand it. I wanted to understand it, but I couldn't catch it quite in the moment. I noticed two things. I noticed the phrase tam tadin ginato and I noticed that he changed pulse rates from line to line and he went from five to six to seven to eight and what he did was play the first half of the tala in the original four pulses per beat version and then change in the second half and always this phrase tam tadin ginato and I didn't I didn't know what that meant but I did know that that's an eight note phrase so I came home, and I really didn't think about it much more. <clears throat> Till that night, I laid down to go to sleep, and bam, I understood what he had done. Here it is. The phrase tam tadin genatum can be substituted for any part of the eight note phrases that make up the composition. So what he did was put it at the end of the first phrase, tam. Like that. 
So, once I, knew, once I understood that, I understood what had happened. The line itself, that second half of the tala, is 32 pulses. Four pulses per beat, eight half beats. Okay, so I said the next one changed to five per beat. And when he did that, it changes the thing from 32 pulses per half cycle to eight times five or 40. <coughs> so what did he do there? Well, he took the whole original phrase and added tam ta din gin at the end of it, like this. Tam, taka din 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 na, kita tum taka tum taka din tam tam di. Taka din 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 na, kita tum taka tum taka din tam tam di. Tam, ta din gin at tam. And when he went to Tithram, the next one, he added it twice. And now I voiced that is tam ta din gin at taka ta din gin at tam. Taka din 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 na kita tum taka tum taka din tam tam di tam kita taka din 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 na kita tum taka tum taka din tam tam di tam ta din gina tum taka ta din gina tum tam. Then he went to the misram, and in the misram he had to add that seven. He had to add it three times at the end. Thirty-two, the original number of pulses, and twenty-four, fifty-six. Okay, eight times seven. So because tam ta ding ginata tam ta ding ginata tam ta ding ginata happens three times, it is sort of by definition a mora. The cadential figure I was telling you about earlier. So I changed it from eight 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 to six eight and ten like this. Ta ding ginata ta ga ta ding ginata ta ga di ka ta ding ginata tam. Okay, and it sounds like this. Tam. Taka din 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 na kita tum taka tum taka din tam tam di tam kita taka din 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 na kita tum taka tum taka din tam tam di tading gina tum taka tading gina tum taka di kita tading gina tum tam. Okay, so this is all good, but now I needed a mora for the whole thing, and it struck me that at the end of the chatursa, at the end of the fast, uh, the next line, which would be fast chatursa. I could take that tading gina the taka the hading gina the taka dika tading gina them and make a mora out of that. And so I had to devise a setup that would fit that. So here's the fast tempo. Tam taka din 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 na kita tum taka tum taka din tam tam di tam kita taka din 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 na kita taka 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 din tam tam di kita taka din 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 na kita taka 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 din taka tum tam tam di taka din 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 na. And in a moment I'm going to play the whole thing, but before I do that, I want to point out that the only reason I was able to understand this thing in, in, enough to figure it out and uh, devise a way to play it was from having used taka dimi taka jono using that eight note phrase underneath to demonstrate it to students for years and years and years. Now we provided notation for you to kind of follow along with this if you want to. Uh, you can see that we put the underlying pattern taka dimi taka jono and then the surface pattern there and then what happens in each of the each of the uh, lines of the composition. So right now, I'm going to try to play the whole thing, okay? I'm going to play each line twice and listen for that tam ta ding gin at the end of each line. At the end of the first version of it, you'll hear two, you'll hear it once. Second time, you'll hear the whole line and then that once. Then tisram, you'll hear it twice. <coughs> Misram, you'll hear it three times. And at the end of the chaturasra, you'll hear the mora that I came up with. Here we go.
So that's it. And I wouldn't have been able to do this or figure it out if I hadn't used that eight note phrase in teaching, in simplifying it to teach people, because I understood that that eight note phrase was what was underneath all these other phrases. And that's what unlocked it for me.